This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from COP28, the U.N. Climate Summit in Dubai. As Israel continues its bombardment of Gaza, we turn now to look at how militarism and war fuels the climate crisis. A new report warns that increased spending by NATO nations will divert millions of dollars from climate finance while increasing greenhouse gas emissions. We're joined now by two guests. Shireen al Jodi is a women, peace and security expert from Lebanon, member of the MENA Middle East North Africa Task Force with the Women and Gender Constituency at COP28. She's also a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in Lebanon and the MENA and Regional Liaison Officer at the Middle East and North Africa Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. And Deborah Burton is here. She's co-founder of Tipping Point North-South. She leads their transformed defense project focused on military emissions and spending climate change and climate finance, co-author of the report Climate Crossfire, how NATO's 2 percent military spending targets contribute to climate breakdown, published with the Transnational Institute. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Uh, Deborah Jordan, let's begin with you. Okay. Um, talk about what you have found in this report. We're going to go specifically to the conflict just hours from us right now yeah, in Gaza yeah, and what that means. Yeah, but yeah. broadly, talk about the link between NATO, war, and climate change. I mean, I think the first thing I want to say sitting here alongside Shirin is I don't think we can be seeing a more extreme example of a war machine in operation than what it is we're seeing and hearing from, from Gaza. Uh, I just want to say that Israel is the 15th largest military spender in the world. And it's spending $24 billion a year on its military. And, and you're seeing this let rip on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a population that really cannot defend themselves. Um, so what we've been working on uh, with Transnational Institute um, and Stop Wolf and Handel in the Netherlands is this, this report, Climate Crossfire. Climate Crossfire is actually a companion piece to a report we wrote last year before COP, and that was looking generally at how military spending accelerates climate breakdown. Uh, so that was a general picture. This year we're looking, we're focusing at NATO, on NATO. NATO is a 31 member strong military alliance. And just to give people a kind of general, a little bit of context to help orientate themselves, global military spending now is $2.2 trillion per annum. It's rising. It's risen something like 20 percent in the past 10 years. NATO accounts for half of that. So 1.1 trillion per annum accrues to NATO. And this is all before Ukraine and Gaza. So this is all going to start taking a sharp incline up. Generally, in terms of emissions, the global military are estimated on patchy data because they don't fully report. But, um, something in the order of five and a half percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, and again, to put that in context, that is more than the 52 countries of the African continent that come in at that's somewhere in the order of three and a half to four percent. That's the total greenhouse gas emission burden. It's hardly a burden for 52 countries. Uh, the global military come in at five and a half percent. So to look to NATO, to come to NATO, which as I said is a 31 member uh, military alliance, accounts for half of military spending. In terms of emissions, it currently would rank, if it were a country, NATO would come in at 40, the equivalent of the Netherlands, for example. Um, and it, it, with this 2 percent of GDP, uh, request, what, what NATO are asking the 31 members to do is to increase on what they're spending now and get their military spending, annual military spending, up to 2 percent or more of GDP. Okay. So what we worked on, we, we asked the question, well, what, what would that mean for greenhouse gas emissions and what would it mean for military spending? And we worked over this eight-year period of 2021 to 2028. And in the case of military spending, it, it would be over that eight year period accruing another $2.57 trillion over that eight year period. 
and that 2.57 trillion would, would get you, as an example, 118 years, 118 years of that paltry 100 billion climate finance figure that was agreed at in the Paris uh, um, meeting in 2015. And what do you mean by climate finance? So this is the 100 billion that was agreed in 2015 but at Hillary Paris. Clinton announced in Paris. As support, climate support, climate finance support for the world's most vulnerable countries. And we, the rich countries, are legally bound to, to deliver that. So what we're trying to do with the scale of military spending, which is in the trillions, it's in the trillions, is to put that alongside these, on the one hand, pledges, and on the other hand, gaps. There are, there are so many climate finance gaps. Um, the 2% GDP target for NATO members in terms of emissions, so there is an emissions burden to this. Currently, NATO is sitting, again, you know, it, it, it's something in the order of, you know, in the order of the Netherlands, emissions, in terms of emissions. That 2% increase over that eight-year period, again, we calculate would bring it, bring it closer to Russia, Russia's emissions burden. Russia is a major, you know, oil-producing country. It's something like 2 billion tonnes of CO2 in equivalent. In fact, actually, uh, President Putin is expected to be here in Dubai tomorrow. What can we say? I mean, you know, you, you, it's clear here at COP, and, and certainly in terms of this issue that we're working on here, you, the military mission story, and it's primarily because of Ukraine, and, and now with Gaza, suddenly we are able to get some oxygen of publicity. You know, we're here now talking about this because of this collision between uh, conflict, wars, conflict-related emissions, which I should say is not in that 5.5% estimate, this estimate of 5.5% of global military, uh, greenhouse gas emissions according to the military does not include conflict, doesn't include conflict. So with Ukraine and now Gaza, we are able to, to illustrate, to show, to, 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 as I say, bring oxygen and publicity to the fact that there is an absolute correlation between military spending. So the more you spend on your big ticket, gas guzzling, fossil fuel, totally fossil fuel reliant hardware, the jets, the tanks, the bombs, the missiles, all of these things that we are seeing raining down on people, they are all fossil fuel dependent. There is an absolute correlation between military spending and the emissions that, that, that come from that, from that hardware. And we are going in the wrong direction. We are absolutely going in the wrong direction. And the NATO 2% target, for example, is completely counter to all climate targets. Say so what you mean by two percent target of GDP. So, so NATO must say spend on the military. They are asking their thirty-one members to spend. I remember 2%. Trump, President Trump kept saying, "You yeah. are not paying In your fact, fair more, share." And and more, we need you to spend. We need you to spend more. And it doesn't really stop at NATO. NATO have allies in other parts of the world who are looking at two percent or more. So this two percent of GDP, it's important. Doesn't sound like very much, but it's very significant because you're talking about orders of billions over a period of time. I want to turn to uh, Shirin El Jerdi. Um, we just <clears throat> came in on Saturday night. Sunday, there was a major protest um, against what's happening in Gaza, calling for a ceasefire. Um, there were at least 100 people protesting, holding a sign that said ceasefire. You were one of the people there. The names of the dead were being intoned throughout the protests. You just heard our last segment uh, talking about what's happening in Gaza. You're with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Can you talk about the connection between war, weapons, and militarism directly what's happening in Gaza? Yeah, we can see like the gloomy picture just like by what we saw now and by Deborah, the uh, numbers that she gave, this is a gloomy picture that we have. And definitely what we see and what we know is that women are disproportionately impacted by conflict. So what about if you have lack of infrastructures, especially when we talk about conflict, it means we're talking about lack of infrastructures, lack of infrastructures of peace, of institutions, and also lack of the rule of law. And unfortunately, this is all unfolding in Gaza and the Middle East at large, in other conflict areas as well. But maybe now we're talking about uh, Palestine per se and what's happening in Gaza. What's happening is, is 
tremendous, I mean, I could not even believe that we are living this at this moment in our history. This is too hard even to believe that we're witnessing that. We're witnessing that within our own eyes. And I think it's just obvious, like the impact of militarization on women. And we've seen it in different spaces. We've seen it, like as now was mentioned, like in hospitals. We've seen it uh, with mothers. We've seen it like uh, at the grassroots. How and many women were pregnant in Gaza? Almost 50,000 women were pregnant at that time. And if, you, if we have seen with the lack of electricity, when electricity was put down, we saw even these infants struggling, struggling to breathe, to continue living. And unfortunately, lots of these newly born kids were also killed. And this is a, a, not only a genocide, I mean, this is, goes beyond humanity. So the, the nexus between climate, militarization, gender is highly now needed, especially now that we are in the COP, especially that the issue of militarization is not put on the agenda. And at times, like we see that the circle, if we really want to talk about emissions, if we really talk, want to talk about fossil fuel phase out, if we really want to talk about uh, GST, if we want to talk about real impacts and outputs out of this COP, we really need to look at militarization. We need to look at, at it from first the resources, the production, the export, the import, and how it is being used. Like now in Gaza and also in Lebanon, the white phosphorus bombs. I don't know if you noticed or if you saw in TikTok, it went viral how, how they're telling people how to remove the white phosphorus bombs. We're used you to mean the white phosphorus from their skin. Yeah, from their skin because it will keep on going into your skin. And what about the implications that it has on the soil? What about the implications that it has on the water, on the earth that we are having and breathing as well? I want to read you something from Al Jazeera. Um, from polluted water supplies to toxic, toxic smoke-filled air, from burning buildings and bodies, every aspect of life in Gaza is now filled with some form of pollution. There's evidence of Israel using white phosphorus weapons both in Gaza and South Lebanon. Uh, this has disastrous effects on both the environment and people's health. Uh, you're focusing on Palestine. You yourself are from Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, Amy, it's, it's, it's in, in, in Palestine. We saw it with our own eyes. And we saw because of the many journalists that they're risking their lives and many who lost their lives as well, risking to take photos and to document the atrocities that are being done. In Lebanon as well, we have seen also have how phosphorus weapons were used and we saw also how this huge area, green areas of olive trees were burned and put down, whether in Gaza or in Lebanon. I mean, it's a huge catastrophe, whether at the forest level, whether at the human level, and it's going beyond, beyond issues of actual present and direct impact to the, uh, the, 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 the trauma, the trauma that everyone is living. And this is from Euromed Human Rights Monitor, due to technological developments affecting the potency of bombs, the explosives dropped on Gaza may be twice as powerful as a nuclear bomb. Exactly. That was even like two weeks ago before the ceasefire. So I, I could see like now I was even scared to see because, I mean, it's, it's, it's too, yeah. you, you cannot even watch these bombs that are being, yesterday I was watching a um, I, I follow several journalists and I was watching her and she was saying, now this is a massacre. If these like now bombs are being used while they, we are called to go to the south to a safe space, but there's no safe space. So this is meant to terminate us. Deborah. You absolutely can't talk about this without the arms industry. Yeah. Because, I mean, they're all, you know, when we talk about even emissions, um, the arms industry, the supply chain for militaries are more polluting than the militaries themselves, which may come as a bit of a surprise. But they are, they are like this. The arms industry, just in the way that um, you can track oil uh, through, and, and military, the military's use of oil through war, of course, when they're in, you know, at war, 
oil, oil usage goes up. So you can track profits, war profits, to the arms industry. There's, there, is, there is no story without, without fully addressing the culpability of, of, of the arms trade. And I, you know, I've brought something I want to read because it will apply to Gaza. It absolutely will apply to Gaza. Their stock shares, their shares are going up as soon as any conflict hit. They're making profits as it is. It's a very nice life, thank you very much, as it is. When conflict kicks in, it's off the scale. So this is the CEO of Raytheon, okay? And I, and I want to read this. Yeah. Everything that's being shipped into Ukraine today, of course, is coming out of stockpiles, either at the DOD, the Department of Defense, or from our NATO allies, and that's all great news. Eventually, we'll have to replenish it, and we will see the benefit to the business over the coming years. That's a guy called Greg Hayes, CEO of Raytheon. Israel, Israel suppliers, everybody that's involved in the food chain, the kind of war machine food chain that is enabling Israel to do what it is doing on Gaza, will be making money. They will be going home very happy with their, with their bottom lines and their, and, their, and their profits in their back pockets. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org slash give.